We're going to be discussing what crypto assets are and why many people are interested in their 10x potential. But first, let's have each of you describe what it is that you do in this space, how you've gotten in crypto. Sure, you want to go first? Or? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Galia Benartzi, co founder of Bancor Protocol. Bancor launched a uh, currency, the Bancor Network Token, BNT, uh, in June of 2017. Bancor is a protocol that allows cryptocurrencies to be automatically convertible, one for the other. So it's a mathematical exchange rate between all currencies in the network, which allows uh, for the long tail of currencies to emerge. We'll get more into that. Cool, I'll go. So I'm Mickey Costa. I'm the, the founder of Access Network, and we're a decentralized token economy dedicated to providing uh, better financial services to the unbanked. So um, basically it's a kind of two-pronged system. You have a, this network of uh, human infrastructure for banking. People in parts of like Africa, for example, today can just with a smartphone become um, ATMs, tellers to the people around them in their community and they're earning tokens for increased activity there. They're then using those tokens to vote and guide uh, the incentives and rewards for a global app marketplace um, of developers because there's kind of just too much stuff to be done on top of that infrastructure. And they're using the tokens to kind of have access to those applications and get discounts on services. Hi, uh, Bill Barheit. Uh, I think you saw me present Abra a few minutes ago. Abra yes. is a cryptocurrency bank uh, that globally allows consumers to make investments, uh, send money, uh, make payments all using uh, Bitcoin-based smart contracts. Uh, we have customers in about uh, almost 100 countries now, and uh, we're one of the fastest growing uh, apps for uh, doing crypto investing and soon other asset classes, uh, all from a smartphone. So we kind of started this discussion already through the talks, but I still want to hear, obviously, from, from Galia and Mickey. How would you define crypto assets or cryptocurrencies, and also how would you differentiate them from other forms of money that people are already familiar with? Um, I'll, I'll leave a more technical answer for you. I'm always motivated by the kind of result of how this can change the world. So to me, what crypto assets um, are is a way for us to, as global citizens, to coordinate together to solve any kind of problem, financial or otherwise, right? So now you have this ability to um, incentivize any kind of behavior you want. You know, a person with a computer can uh, create um, a trustless environment where people can coordinate to solve a problem. Um, and the other exciting thing for me um, uh, about tokens as opposed to the old financial world is, um, is liquidity, right? Um, certain things today in the developed world, like a car or an apartment, are you know, when you can tokenize these things, you can collateralize them more. Uh, you can share rights in them, you can share and sell them themselves. And that can be applied also to our work in West Africa where someone can do the same thing to a goat. And uh, that's just exciting for, I think, all sorts of parties, private and, and public, and even old institutional people that we sometimes rag on because now you have a, a whole new asset class um, from digital memes to you know tokenized apartment buildings that just didn't exist before. So it just allows for completely new things that didn't exist before. I'll add to that, uh, if we go back to what money actually is, uh, money is a tool that we use to collaborate. Like you said, it's a tool that we use to create trust uh, between large networks of people, people you might not know personally. Um, and most importantly, money is a, a belief system. It's an agreement system. Um, and so unlike some other inventions like the wheel or things that are, are more physical and, and more defined, uh, the invention of money is actually very open to interpretation in terms of what we believe it to be and what we agree um, on. And so uh, Laura mentioned, maybe you heard her say in the opening that um, there's this feeling now that you can create money out of thin air. Um, all the money that we use was created in a way out of thin air. Um, and these cryptocurrencies are created uh, in a way out of thin air and that doesn't make them not valuable. Uh, because they still represent some kind of agreement uh, between people, and that's what the money is meant to um, virtualize, basically. So our work at Bancor uh, is basically around looking at a multi-currency world. We look at Bitcoin as the first user-generated currency, 
Um, so that's a, a concept from the internet, from consumer internet. Whenever you reduce the technical barriers to entry and you let folks approach tools uh, like WordPress or YouTube, uh, the internet shows us that you eventually see millions and hundreds of millions of folks approach and use these tools and, and use them to create. Uh, content and so Bitcoin and the open source nature of the technology is the first user-generated currency that we've seen um, and the team at Bancor believes that where you see one you'll soon see hundreds of millions um, of these user-generated currencies like Bill said we today have hundreds thousands probably um, of currencies uh, and we don't see that slowing down the real question with all of these currencies and, and with any currency what makes a currency money um, is that we agree that it's money, is that someone else will accept it uh, from you in exchange uh, for something. Um, to date, we have uh, outsourced this ability to governments or empowered our governments to create these monies for us. Um, the, the monies of countries are accepted, they're recognized by people at some exchange rate or another. Uh, but in a world with hundreds of millions uh, of currencies, what will make any one of them potentially valuable uh, is only their liquidity to other currencies. It's only their fungibility, as you said, to either another currency that you want or a good and service that you want. So to answer your question, um, anything is money as long as we agree to it. So I think that what Bitcoin did is, and digital currencies have been around for decades, it's just that what Bitcoin did is it changed the narrative, right? Uh, up until now, the, the, the slogan for money has been, in God we trust and ultimately let the people uh, in that secret room at the, for the, the Fed Board of Governors make the decisions. Now the mantra is trust no one, verify via the code, and play your role in the incentive-based ecosystem. Now, that's enabled via this cool technology that solved the double spend problem, you know, using every, comp it's very inefficient, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of solving that problem, it's, it's, it's huge and it's a fundamental shift in the way we should think about, think about money. And Galia, I actually wanted you to talk about Bancor's experience with Hearts because I think that's like a really concrete example that people can wrap their minds around. Yeah, sure. So um, the team behind Bancor previously experimented with what we call user-generated currencies or community currencies. Um, community currencies you can think of like monopoly money, uh, which you drop into a group of people. Um, and what we discovered, shocking, is that when you give people money, uh, they use it. And we ran pilots all over the world with tens of thousands of users in each group. Um, the one Laura's talking about was called Hearts, and it was a currency issued for mothers. Uh, so mothers could join this group. They would get hearts when they joined. There were all these things they could do to get more hearts, like volunteer at the school, babysit for other um, parents in the neighborhood, all, all kinds of things that were relevant to that community. Um, and then they could spend the hearts with each other. So all the mothers would upload into the mobile app things they wanted to sell, clothes, bikes, toys, services, consultations, um, really over 50,000 items we saw at, at any given time. Um, and it was a fascinating experiment because in just under a year, we saw over $20 million worth of commerce take place among 20,000 people uh, only using hearts. So no dollars, uh, no fiat currencies exchange hands. How do we calculate it? Just one heart was worth one dollar. That's what we told uh, folks. It wasn't worth that, meaning you couldn't cash it out, but for pricing, for ease of pricing. A heart is a dollar. If you're going to sell a cake uh, for 20 bucks, you could sell it for 20 hearts um, in this network. And what we realized was that when you look at a number like GDP for that year that we ran this experiment, you know, GDP could be uh, $20 billion in a, in a small country. And, it, and in this country, it was actually 20 billion plus 20 million um, that no one was counting because that was economic collaboration that was happening between folks um, in a currency that, that wasn't being measured. Um, things got really interesting after that year when we started seeing usage uh, plateau and then decline. Um, and what we understood in pilot after pilot with uh, mothers, with children, with vegans, I mean really a, a diverse um, set of use cases in a diverse set of countries was that liquidity ultimately was the breaking point of these currencies. What does that mean? If you couldn't use the hearts to shop at the supermarket, or if you couldn't use the hearts when you went out of your community or on a vacation to a different place, the meaning of that money uh, collapsed in your mind, right? It's like you can use Monopoly money in a game, 
but you can't use it anywhere else, so we don't think of it as money. Um, and that's actually how we backed into the solution we work on at Bancor, which is how could you allow all of these currencies, potentially hundreds of millions of currencies like hearts and stars and, and, and things for communities all over the world, how could you allow folks to get the abundance that they were getting out of local commerce and yet still have these currencies be globally relevant, globally tradable? Um, and that's when we move to essentially a mathematical-based solution, which, as Bill said, programmable money um, is the key here. You can now solve problems uh, that the economists of, of old uh, knew were problems but didn't know the solutions to. Um, and now with very simple algorithms, with very simple computer code, you could tell a heart how much it's worth in dollars at any given time based on a really simple formula that says, you know, if more people are using hearts, the value is climbing up. And if people are not using hearts, if they're selling out of them, the value is climbing down. Um, and you could make those formulas take in any kind of factor that you think is relevant or that folks in your community think is relevant. Um, and that's what we call the long tail, is really um, a world with hundreds of millions of currencies like hearts that are relevant to communities, whether they're geographic, whether they're local, whether they're affinity-based groups, you know, folks um, online and, and in different networks, whether they're corporate currencies. Um, and truly this idea of making money out of thin air is more like making agreements um, online or in code uh, between different networks of people. Something that's come up a lot, which I also talked about in my speech, was decentralization. And we've been talking about, you know, these like user-generated currencies or user-incentivized systems. And, um, you know, you talked about just providing the tools and then people can create their own. But how do we get there? Because a lot of these start off somewhat centralized, right? There's like an identifiable group of people that are creating this project. So how do you get from kind of the original version, which is somewhat centralized, to an actual decentralized uh, crypto network? Yeah, I'll give you my take. Uh, I, I think what Mickey's doing is really interesting in creating the on-ramps and off-ramps, too. Uh, I think it's going to happen in three stages. I, I think that the... So first of all, we look at kind of the, 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 the Bitcoin world as... Uh, the, my favorite analogy is the Matrix, right? When you're, you've seen the movie, when you're inside the Matrix, in theory, you don't know about the outside world, except for the people that have hacked in, and they use these hard lines to kind of hack into the Matrix. And that's how we use exchanges now. Exchanges represent kind of the hard line back into the banking system to get money in and out. So phase one, is, is, is that, that Austrian uh, playbook that I mentioned before, which is massive speculation, which is what should happen when you have a deflationary asset that's been created out of nothing, right? And it's playing out that rule book. And so phase two says, okay, if the deflationary asset via stops and starts, because, especially because governments don't like it, eventually gets up and to the right from a price perspective, the purse strings will be loosened because people are gonna have massive amounts of wealth they wanna take advantage of, and people will offer lots of payment services because you know, people are going to be incentivized to, to, to use uh, their, uh, their crypto to make payments. Um, and then the third is what I talked about earlier, where you see true programmable money in the form of smart contracts and other things enable things like micro, contra uh, micro payments, decentralized investing networks, hardware as a service, myriad applications that can't be done easily without, or at all without cryptocurrency, but require the first two steps. Right. The, the press doesn't understand when they write about the lack of usage of Bitcoin that you simply can't bypass the first two steps in creating a decentralized system. And it has to play itself out in order to get there. Right. And 20 years is not a long time frame. I had reunion last year with folks from Netscape. We couldn't believe <laughs> that it's been 25 years, but it has. Right. And, and so this time, is, it's, it's, it's not that long when you think about how many currencies have failed over the last 250 years to put the right pieces and tollways in place to make all this work in the decentralized model. So uh, I think the, the value of decentralization on the long enough timeline is kind of everything. Um, so on a technical level, you need to have more um, on-chain governance. You know, how do we coordinate and make decisions together? But what interests me more and I think will lead to adoption more is, is really more of a philosophical economic point, right? You know, if all things are equal, in a centralized legacy system, let's say like a Facebook, right? Um, and the service, the network effect is the same. The value of Facebook and Facebook, decentralized Facebook is the same. The only difference is decentralized Facebook pays you automatically, you know, $10 a month or $50 a year based upon your data and the things that are being monetized. I, you know, we would think that economically you would go and join the decentralized Facebook. So the thing that matters the most, you know, I think that thesis is easy to get on board with. The thing that matters the most to me is 
people talk about a long time, a long timeline all the time. You know, what's going to happen first? And I'm a big believer that if you look at the developing world, you'll see the value of a decentralized company or service have you know, more adoption first because it's really hard to match the value of Facebook today or Uber in the US. They do a pretty good job, right? So when you go to the developing world, and I'll use, we're talking a lot about, thankfully today, so solar and energy. So let's go to the developing world and blanketly across the place like Africa. Um, some people don't have energy, or if they do, they're spending about $10 a month on it, right? And this could be 10, 5% of your monthly income, it's a lot. Um, so now with, with solar, it, you know, it, it completely works. So if you can have mechanisms to fund solar energy grids, a local community can pay, continue to pay to use something, maybe $5 a month. Now they have reliable energy. I think it's great that it's green, but maybe they don't care. Um, it's way cheaper, right? So now they're beating the legacy value of uh, the $10 a month government-run legacy system that often goes out for like hours a day, by the way, right? And, but what's the result now compared back to me at home where I have reliable and at a pro rata level pretty cheap electricity with Con Edison in New, in New York City? I'm not the co-owner of this network. Right. So now you have these local networks where you have, you're solving a real problem and people are co-owners and profiters as users of something that they use. And I'll just end on this note at a high level because that model could be applied to pretty much uh, anything else at an infrastructure, you know, real world level. Um, it's a lot cheaper using back of the envelope math to build a hyperloop somewhere than to rebuild the New York City subway system. So I think places where they have real pain points and they don't have a legacy system as a kind of a blank canvas to build things, you'll see using crypto economics um, and decentralized models, a lot of this idea of users co-owning things that they use. And you have a mix of this kind of free market libertarian ideals that have this kind of more utilitarian outcome. By the way, just one comment on that. So if you look at the early writings from I say this like the religion, but I didn't mean it that way. Like the, when Satoshi was first releasing Bitcoin, he actually talked about, or she talked about whether Bitcoin was being released then to it as a result of the financial crisis that was happening at the time. Uh, and, and they said, no, we're actually trying to prepare for the one that's coming next in 10 or 15 years, because like clockwork, it is coming, right? And so let's get ready for that by laying the, the rails and the groundwork to be prepared for that now. That's interesting. So Kali, I want you to answer this question in particular because of what happened with Bancor recently where your, uh, uh, I guess they call it the escape hatch key was, was exposed. So can you talk a little bit about that? I know you, you guys have probably thought a lot about this centralization versus decentralization pain point. Sure, so I'll add that um, we think Decentralization is a journey and not a destination. Um, what do we mean by that? If you, you know, go to the essential nature of what it is we're trying to do, and different people have different definition of this, but we're trying to create systems that are more inclusive, that are more fair, that are more accessible, um, and that hopefully make living together as uh, humans on this planet um, a, a nicer experience, a better experience. Um, and decentralization is a legitimate uh, cause, right? Because when we see centralization, when we see governments, when we see central banks, when we see, you know, over time, if we go into back in history, kings and empires and, and all of the formats that, that we've taken around governance, um, centers tend to abuse the power, right? That's the problem. If the centers were not abusing power, we might not be on this march uh, for decentralization. And so the question becomes not must we decentralize, but how do we prevent centers from abusing power? Decentralizing is certainly one of the tools that we have in the toolbox. Um, but now, thanks to programmability, we also have other tools, um, like uh, open source, like transparency. If you could see every single dollar that was printed by the Fed and where it went in that moment, um, there'd be much less abuse, probably, by you know, bodies like the Fed. They might still do, do some bad things, but they would have to account. Um, for a lot of the things that they do do, right? It's, it's the, the call for transparency. Um, and so to Laura's question, recently at Bancor, we used a what you would call a centralized uh, control within our smart contracts, which allowed us in this situation to uh, retrieve over $10 million of stolen uh, tokens from the network. Uh, there was a security breach, there was a hack of the system, and millions of dollars of cryptocurrency were stolen. 
our uh, central control was used to return the part of that currency that we had control over. Um, and so this, this conversation ensued about decentralization versus centralization. Um, and we came out with a few additional uh, points that we think are really important when looking at decentralization as a concept. One is, like I say, uh, open source and transparency. Can you see when an emergency control is being used? Do you know who has the ability to use it? Are there clear um, statements around who can use it, when they will use it, how that will be announced? Okay, so the, the transparency of the network is a big uh, factor, whether it's decentralized or centralized. Um, the second one is forkability. If the code of a network is easily forkable, um, because it's open source, uh, and because all the data is owned by the users, um, then again, you, in, you extremely prevent abuse. If Bancor knows that when we abuse our controls, folks can make their own Bancor, take all the code and leave, that's gonna make us highly unlikely to abuse our own system uh, because the next thing that will happen is it will collapse. Um, and the third thing is really the uh, custody of the users. Um, do users in the network, like in a decentralized Facebook example or in the Bancor network, do users maintain control of their own assets and their own passwords and their own private keys at all times? Uh, with Bancor, the answer is yes. Even during a security breach, uh, when the whole network was down, any user could access their own wallet, could access their own tokens, could take them all, could move them somewhere else um, at any moment, um, even while our network was down. Um, and so, again, whether the um, central control that we had to uh, activate in an emergency situation makes the network not decentralized is something that we would say, look at, look at these other parameters. Um, if users always have access to their own assets, um, we think that is a huge step towards decentralization. Um, the last thing I'll say is that we think it takes some trust to get to trustless. Right, so you're talking about the crisis that will come in 15 years. Um, will we have products and services? Will we have teams uh, working in the space that are able to provide progress um, in this time frame? Or will we keep waiting for the perfect solution um, to materialize perfectly in a technology environment that is incredibly unknown? Um, and so again, some of the tools that we offer to the community as kind of um, pathways Right, and the thing about progress is it's progressive um, and it goes step by step often, um, are things like on-ramps. So uh, we, as an example, uh, gave our smart contract three years uh, before it moves to its uh, upgradable and immutable state. Um, we, we told the community, we think it'll take about three years to monitor the early behavior of the network to make sure that the code is written appropriately to test some of the edge cases that are impossible to test uh, until you go live. Um, and this three-year on-ramp um, to immutability is what we think is safe uh, for everyone. And the first three years of this network will, will be the most um, accountable and responsible for the network safety. We use the analogy sometimes of an infant. Um, an infant will become a fully self-sustaining human eventually that can feed themselves and live on their own without their parents. Not on day one. <laughs> and not on year one, there's a certain amount of care that it takes for that infant to become even potentially self-sustaining. Um, and we think networks, especially technology networks, um, written on very new underlying blockchains like Ethereum or EOS or whatever you're building on, written in smart contracts, which are a new type of programming paradigm uh, where you're deploying immutable code uh, to a blockchain. Um, we think that these on-ramps are another tool that the community has um, in our toolbox to getting where we want, which is more decentralized systems, not decentralize or die. So we're running out of time, but I want to ask one last question. Here we've been through this like major speculative phase. Um, we're obviously coming down from that. Um, but when I look at some of the usage statistics, even on the more popular projects like CryptoKitties or Augur, which just launched to kind of a lot of fanfare. And they've all got, you know, like 50 or less users per 24 hour periods. And I mean, it's just, there's just very little usage of these things. So how do we go from speculation to adoption? I think we need more real world use cases. To, to Bill's point earlier, um, the best technology, you don't know how it works. I, I, when I get into my car, it works. When I watch Netflix, it works. And I think what's taking us some time is, what's a natural human behavior is, 
Well, it's a global movement. A lot of technologists are looking in their own backyard. You know, how can my life be better? And to what I said earlier, I think that, that just is really hard to compete with legacy systems. I think if we look to places like the developing world where they have pain points longer than I can list in any amount of time, um, you're going to see those real world uses happen. I think what's really important is as we have a real world user base that's using crypto technology under the hood to solve myriad problems, how is it including the rest of the world and developed world users, right? So back to that solar analogy, can we fund those things? And in, I'm not kidding with this napkin math, in two months can we get a 2x investment? I'm outside before this conference today and there's an ad on like the garbage disposal for the paper or something and for a bank. And it goes, lock in your money for 2% CD. And inflation's about 2% in America. So I, I think also a lot of the average people here were lacking, and I think it'll happen around fi financial stuff first, we're, we're lacking access to wealth investments and people over here are a great pl place individually and communally to invest our money, and we just don't have an easy-to-use application for us to, to connect to each other financially. Look, I mean, in 1993, you had to install a TCP IP stack on a Windows PC to access the internet, right? Most, I'm sure anybody here under the age of 30 doesn't understand what I just said. So, which is fine, you shouldn't have to. And look where we are 25 years later. My prediction is, is that Bitcoin or its successor will become the payment and settle rail for, for what become banking transactions of the future, hopefully via something like Lightning on top. And the average person in this room or anywhere, maybe less so in this room because the savvy people, but the average person will not know that, that it's using Bitcoin or its successor. They simply won't. It'll be using the you know, fancy schmancy multi-six smart contract stuff that I rambled on about before. How but the bottom line is... Just but, Go ahead. I'm just curious, how long do you think it will take to get to the point where people will use these technologies in that way but not know that they're doing so? Ten years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because there's a lot of liquidity rails that have to be laid first. We need more hard lines into the matrix in, in developing markets uh, to make it you know, really accessible. Uh, but the, the large-scale applications, which may be collectibles, they may be you know, new tokens on Ethereum, they may be just Bitcoin, that are take advantage of those rails, I think are, are five to ten years out. Wow. Yeah, I think on the on the shorter end of, of that spectrum, five years, we're already seeing um, at Bancor, uh, we launched a project in Kenya where paper currencies that folks are using in rural villages, they don't have access to the national money. One of the biggest problems with money is that not everyone has it. That's, that's the problem. Um, and the killer app f for blockchain is money, lots of money all kinds of money, um, money that people can actually get in their communities and that they can actually use uh, to buy and sell goods and services right where they are. It's not financialization, it's commerce, um, it's trade, it's living life with the people around you. Um, we've already seen this literally this week in Kenya, the first tomatoes were traded on the blockchain um, and uh, folks in a town were given cryptocurrency, put it on their smartphone. It's true the apps are still you know, a bit clunky, a bit advanced, but that's changing um, quickly because we have the underlying infrastructure, the internet, the smartphones, um, and the, the things that came before. Um, and they're using the currencies at the market so that they can trade amongst themselves. It's already happening. The moment the village next door gets wind that this village just made their own money, and now everyone's using it, and buying and selling from each other, we think it's gonna catch like wildfire. Great, well, we'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thanks.